The Galactic Academy of Xenobiology loomed against the purple-tinted sky of Centauri Prime, its crystalline spires reaching toward the three moons that hung like pearls in the afternoon light. Inside Lecture Hall 7, the air hummed with the distinctive sounds of 30 different species chattering in their native tongues, while universal translators worked overtime to maintain coherent conversation. Professor Alex Thorne strode into the room, his boots clicking against the polished floor. He was the only human on staff, and quite possibly the only human within 50 light years. A grin played across his face as he surveyed his advanced xenobiology class. The subject of today's lesson was bound to ruffle some feathers, scales, and whatever else his students happened to be sporting. Good morning, class. Today we're diving into one of my personal favorite topics, Earth's most lethal creatures. Professor Thorne's voice carried a hint of mischief that made several students shift uncomfortably in their seats. From the back of the room came a sound like grinding rocks, which the translator smoothly converted into laughter. The source was Zix, a towering mass of crystalline plates and bioluminescent nodes from the warrior planet Crixus. Professor, with all due respect, your Earth creatures are barely worth studying. My species evolved on a world with gravity three times that of Earth. Our weakest juvenile could crush your planet's fiercest predator. Fascinating observation, Zix. Thorne's enthusiasm seemed to grow with the challenge. Perhaps you'd like to share more about your species' legendary resilience? Before Zix could respond, a melodic voice chimed in. It belonged to Lumi, a bioluminescent being whose form rippled like the Aurora Borealis. Professor, I've been studying Earth's biodiversity. The sheer variety of defense mechanisms your species coexist with is remarkable. The chemical warfare alone... Oh, please! This time it was Nova, her crystalline form catching the light as she gestured dismissively with three of her seven appendages. Coming from one of the wealthiest families in the Andromeda galaxy, she had a habit of treating everything as beneath her notice. Are we really going to spend another lecture on this backwater planet? Their most dangerous predator couldn't even survive the atmospheric pressure on my homeworld. Professor Thorne walked to his desk, picking up what appeared to be a simple data cube. With a flick of his wrist, he activated it, and a holographic display filled the center of the lecture hall. The image showed a creature so small that several students had to activate their magnification implants to see it clearly. Today's subject is particularly special, Thorne said, his voice taking on a theatrical quality. What you're looking at is a Trax robustus, commonly known as the Sydney funnel-web spider. And yes, Zix, before you say anything, it is quite small compared to your impressive form. The hologram rotated, showing the spider from various angles. Its dark, glossy body and powerful fangs drew a mix of dismissive snorts and curious murmurs from the class. Now, who can tell me what makes this little Earth native so remarkable? Thorne asked, looking around the room with an expression that suggested he was sitting on the galaxy's best secret. Lumi's form pulsed with eager colors. According to my research, it produces a complex neurotoxin, but surely something so small. Small? Zix interrupted, rising to his full three-meter height. It's practically microscopic. Professor, you can't seriously expect us to believe this. This speck poses any real threat. My exoskeleton alone? Thorne's smile widened, and there was something in his expression that made even Nova lean forward in her seat. Ah, Zix, I was hoping you'd say that. Would you be interested in a practical demonstration? After all, nothing teaches quite like experience and we do have a specimen in our xenobiology vault. The lecture hall fell silent. Even the universal translators seemed to hold their breath, waiting for Zix's response. The warrior student's bioluminescent nodes pulsed with pride and perhaps a touch of arrogance. Professor, Zix rumbled, mandibles clicking in amusement. Are you suggesting that this tiny arachnid could pose any threat to a Crixian warrior? I accept your challenge. Let the class witness the superiority of evolved defenses over primitive Earth fauna. As the class erupted in excited chatter, Professor Thorne's expression was that of a person who had just successfully baited a trap. He caught Lumi's concerned gaze and winked, causing the Aurora-like student to ripple with worried colors. Nova had finally dropped her board facade, all seven of her eyes fixed intently on the hologram, still rotating, 
in the center of the room. Well then, Thorne said, clapping his hands together. Shall we adjourn to the containment facility? I believe we're about to have a rather educational experience. The containment facility resembled a cathedral of science with its soaring transparent walls and state-of-the-art security systems. Professor Thorne led his eager students through a series of airlocks, each one adjusting to accommodate the various atmospheric needs of the diverse class. Before we proceed to our practical demonstration, Thorne announced, gesturing toward a large hollow screen, let's review some of Earth's most notorious creatures. Computer, display file, E-379, Earth's apex predators. The screen flickered to life, showing a sequence of Earth's most feared hunters. A massive great white shark breached the ocean's surface, jaws wide. A Bengal tiger stalked through dense jungle. A saltwater crocodile lunged from murky waters. Primitive muscle power, Zix commented, his crystalline plates shifting in what the other students recognized as a gesture of contempt. On my world, we have predators that could swallow these whole... Nova's crystalline form chimed in agreement. I must concur with our warrior friend, Professor. These creatures seem to rely solely on brute force. Where is the elegance? The evolutionary sophistication? Ah, Professor Thorne raised a finger, his eyes twinkling. That's where our little friend comes in. Computer, display specimen, A1342, Sydney funnel web spider, full anatomical breakdown. The display changed, showing the spider in microscopic detail. Its fangs, longer than any other spider species relative to body size, gleamed menacingly in the holographic light. Now class, what makes this spider truly remarkable isn't its size or strength, Thorne continued, pacing before the display. It's the unique composition of its venom. Unlike most venomous creatures, the funnel web's toxin, called delta hexatoxin, is particularly lethal to primates. The fascinating part? It seems to have a similar effect on various sentient species across the galaxy. Lumi's form rippled with intense blues and greens. Professor, are you suggesting this venom evolved specifically to target advanced nervous systems? That's one theory, Thorne nodded. But what's even more interesting is how this little spider challenges everything we think we know about evolutionary arms races. You see, there were no primates in Australia when this venom evolved. It's essentially an evolutionary overkill, a weapon system far more powerful than it needed to be. Weapon system? Zix's laughter echoed through the facility. Professor, you speak of this creature as if it were designed for warfare. Look at it. Its entire body mass is less than a single plate of my exoskeleton. Thorne's expression grew serious. Size isn't everything, Zix. This spider's venom can kill a human in 15 minutes. The only reason my species survived encounters with it is because we developed antivenoms. But here's the kicker. We found it affects nearly 80% of known sentient species in the galaxy. Nova's dismissive posture faltered slightly. Surely you're exaggerating, Professor. The biochemical variations between species are precisely what make this creature so fascinating, Thorne interrupted. The venom doesn't just attack one specific type of nervous system. It's like a master key that can unlock death in countless species. We still don't fully understand how or why. Zix moved closer to the display, his bioluminescent nodes pulsing with increasing intensity. Professor, you claim this tiny creature could harm a Crixian warrior? We evolved in an environment that would crush this spider into paste. Our nervous system is protected by backup pathways and redundant organs. Would you care to test that theory? Thorne asked quietly. The entire class fell silent. We have a secure testing chamber, and of course we keep antivenoms for all known reactions. It would be educational. The warrior student's plates shifted into an aggressive display pattern. You question the superiority of Crixian physiology? Very well. I accept your challenge, Professor. Let the class witness how a true warrior species handles Earth's most lethal creature. Zix, perhaps we should review the data first, Lumi interjected, their form flickering with warning reds and oranges. The chemical analysis of the venom suggests... Analysis is for the weak, Zix declared. We Crixians believe in practical knowledge. Besides, the specimen is safely contained, yes? What harm could come from a simple demonstration? 
Professor Thorne's expression was unreadable as he moved toward a secure console. Indeed, what harm? Computer, begin safety protocols for containment chamber three. Class, please proceed to the observation area. Zix, if you'll follow me, we'll need to go through some basic safety procedures before the demonstration. As the class filed into the observation area, Nova whispered to Lumi, surely the professor wouldn't allow this if there was any real danger. Lumi's colors had faded to worried pastels. I don't know. Did you notice he never actually answered that question? And why does he look so amused? Behind them, Professor Thorne was methodically entering commands into the security console, humming what sounded suspiciously like an old earth funeral march. The containment chamber's massive doors began to open with a soft hiss, and somewhere in the facility's secure vault, a small specimen container was being prepared for transport. The stage was set for a lesson none of them would ever forget. The containment chamber gleamed with an almost surgical sterility. Professor Thorne moved through the preparation sequence with practice precision, each step accompanied by the soft chime of safety protocols engaging. The observation windows were actually force fields, capable of containing everything from toxic gases to dimensional rifts, a fact that was making several students increasingly nervous. Now then, Thorne announced, his voice carrying through the chamber's communication system. Before we proceed, let me explain exactly what we're dealing with. Computer display full toxicological breakdown of a tracks robustus venom. The air filled with floating molecular diagrams, complex chains of atoms spinning lazily in three dimensions. The funnel web's venom contains at least 40 different toxic compounds, but the main player is our friend Delta Hexatoxin. This lovely little molecule does something fascinating. It prevents nervous system ion channels from closing. Lumi's form pulsed with recognition. But Professor, if the ion channels don't close? Exactly, Thorne beamed. The nervous system goes into complete overdrive. Every nerve fires continuously. In humans, this leads to massive autonomic nervous system disruption, excessive neurotransmitter release, and ultimately organ failure. Nova raised three appendages in alarm. Professor, I've been studying Crixian biology. Their nervous system may be protected, but their ion channels are remarkably similar to... Similar to primates, yes, Thorne nodded, still focused on the preparation console. Fascinating convergent evolution, really. Now, Zix, please step into the airlock. We need to decontaminate you before the demonstration. Zix strode forward, crystalline plates gleaming under the harsh lights. All this preparation for such a tiny creature? My species fought wars against beings that could swallow cities whole. Safety first, Thorne called cheerfully, initiating the decontamination sequence. We wouldn't want any outside contaminants affecting our little experiment, would we? In the observation area, the other students were growing increasingly agitated. A group of gaseous beings had condensed into worried clouds, while several silicon-based life forms were vibrating at frequencies associated with extreme stress. Professor, a normally quiet student named Vex spoke up, their crystalline form refracting light into stress patterns. The last time we studied earth venoms, you mentioned that they were the inspiration for three new classes of military-grade neurotoxins. Did I? Thorn asked innocently, while activating what appeared to be emergency medical protocols. How fascinating. Now, class, pay close attention to the specimen container being brought in. Notice the triple-layered containment field? There's a reason for that. Through a separate airlock, a robotic arm carefully transported a small, transparent cube. Inside, barely visible to the naked eye, sat the funnel web spider. It looked almost disappointingly ordinary, dark, glossy, with legs that seemed too delicate to pose any real threat. Now then, Thorne continued, his voice taking on a more serious tone. A few ground rules. First, at no point should anyone other than Zix enter the containment field. Second, we have emergency stasis fields ready to deploy at the first sign of severe reaction. Third, I've already contacted the medical bay. They're standing by with a full crash team and universal antidote array. Nova's crystalline form chimed in distress. Medical bay? Crash team? Professor, is this level of precaution really necessary for... Fourth, Thorne continued as if he hadn't heard her. 
We have quantum entangled emergency transporters locked onto every student in case of containment breach. Standard protocol, nothing to worry about. In the decontamination chamber, Zix's bioluminescent nodes were pulsing with what might have been the first flickers of uncertainty. Professor, you seem to be taking excessive precautions for a simple demonstration. Oh, no, 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 Thorne assured him, fingers dancing across the control panel. This is just basic lab safety. We take the same precautions when handling extremely dangerous pathogens, planet-killing superweapons, and my mother-in-law's holiday fruitcake. Speaking of which, has everyone signed the liability waivers? The class stared at him in horrified silence. Just kidding about the waivers? Thorne laughed, but nobody missed how he double-checked the emergency transport coordinates. Now then, Zix, are you ready to make history? You'll be the first Crixian to ever undergo this particular test. Assuming you survive, the data will be invaluable. The massive warrior stepped into the containment chamber, trying to maintain his dignified bearing, despite the growing chorus of concerned murmurs from his classmates. The spider, still in its transparent cube, sat on a pedestal in the center of the room, looking absurdly small compared to Zix's towering form. Remember, Thorne's voice had lost all trace of humor. At the first sign of systemic shock, we abort. The emergency medical team can reach you in 2.3 seconds. The universal antidote array is primed. The stasis field can freeze you between heartbeats if necessary. Any last questions? Zix stared at the tiny creature that had prompted such extensive safety measures. For the first time, a note of uncertainty crept into his voice. Professor, you seem quite confident this spider can affect me. What makes you so sure? Thorne's smile could only be described as predatory. Let's just say you're not the first proud warrior to underestimate Earth's little surprises. Shall we begin? Through the crystalline facets of Zix's visual processors, the spider appeared almost comically insignificant. Its eight legs moved with deliberate precision as Professor Thorne remotely opened the containment cube. The arachnid emerged, each step causing minute vibrations in the chamber's sensitive floor. Behold, class, Thorne's voice carried a hint of theatrical flair. The Sydney funnel-web spider in all its glory. Notice how it raises its front legs when threatened, exposing the fangs that deliver its notorious venom. As if on cue, the spider assumed the defensive posture Thorne described. Zix's bioluminescent nodes pulsed with what his classmates recognized as derisive laughter. Professor, I've seen more threatening creatures in my morning cleansing solution. The spider, however, seemed unnaturally focused on Zix. Its multiple eyes reflected the containment chamber's harsh lighting, creating an almost hypnotic effect. Several students noticed how it oriented itself toward the crystalline warrior, moving with the fluid grace of an evolved predator. Fascinating, Thorne commented, making notes on his data pad. It appears to be responding to your bioelectric field, the same way they detect prey on Earth. Now, Zix, remember our agreement. You are to allow the spider one attempt at penetrating your defenses. No aggressive movements, no attacks. We're testing its capabilities, not yours. Zix lowered himself to one knee, bringing his massive form closer to the tiny adversary. I still don't understand how something so small could possibly... What in the name of the crystal moons? The spider had moved faster than anyone expected, faster than the chamber's sensors could properly track. One moment it was cautiously approaching, the next, it had launched itself at Zix's exposed joint section, where the crystalline plates were thinnest to allow for movement. Perfect targeting, Thorne noted calmly, while several students cried out in alarm. They naturally aim for gaps in hard exoskeletons. Remarkable predatory instinct. Zix remained frozen in position, his nodes flickering between amusement and disbelief. It appears your earth creature has failed, Professor. I don't feel any... Wait, his voice modulation shifted to a higher frequency. There's a strange sensation in my tertiary nerve cluster. And so it begins, Thorne muttered, activating additional monitoring systems. Class, pay close attention to Zix's bioluminescent display. The color changes will indicate the progression of envenomation. The warrior attempted to stand, but his movements had become uncoordinated. This is unexpected. My thermal regulation seems to be, Professor, why are my secondary nodes activating without command? 
The class watched in horror as Zix's bioluminescent patterns began firing in random sequences, creating a disco-like effect that would have been beautiful if it wasn't so clearly unnatural. His crystalline plates started vibrating at frequencies that produced an unsettling harmonic resonance. Preliminary effects, Thorne narrated, now surrounded by floating holographic displays showing Zix's vital signs. The venom is interfering with his bioelectric field regulation. Notice how the random neural firing is affecting his bioluminescence. In humans, this stage is accompanied by profuse sweating and muscle spasms. In Zick's case, we're seeing uncontrolled energy discharge through his nodes. Professor Zick's voice had lost all trace of its former confidence. I appear to be experiencing what humans call panic. My tertiary heart is beating at triple its normal rate, and I'm detecting cascade failures in my auxiliary nervous systems. Nova's crystalline form vibrated in distress. Professor, surely this has gone far enough. Look at his color patterns. Indeed, Zix's normally brilliant bioluminescence was cycling through colors no one had ever seen him display before. His massive form swayed unsteadily, crystalline plates grinding against each other in unnatural patterns. Just a moment, Thorne held up a hand, studying the readings intently. We're about to witness something quite extraordinary. Zix, could you describe what you're experiencing? Everything is wrong, the warrior managed, his voice modulation becoming increasingly erratic. My strength, it means nothing. The smallest movements require immense concentration. How can this be? The venom of this tiny creature? It's like liquid lightning in my circulatory system. The spider, having completed its demonstration, had retreated to a corner of the chamber, seemingly uninterested in the chaos it had caused. It began methodically cleaning its fangs, a gesture that appeared almost smugly satisfied. Fascinating, Thorne exclaimed, while simultaneously signaling the medical team. The venom appears to be affecting his crystalline matrix at the molecular level. The ion channel disruption is causing his entire bioelectric field to destabilize. Zix, I believe you're about to make xenobiology history. I don't want to make history, Zix groaned, his massive form now visibly trembling. I want to, to... His voice trailed off as his bioluminescent nodes began flickering in a pattern that made several students cover their visual sensors. And that's quite enough of that, Thorne announced cheerfully, pressing a sequence of commands. A stasis field sprang into existence around Zix freezing him in mid-collapse. Medical team, you're up. Let's get our overconfident friend stabilized before his tertiary nervous system completely shorts out. As the emergency response team rushed in, Thorne turned to address his thoroughly shocked class. And that, students, is why we never underestimate any living creature, no matter how small. Now, who would like to discuss the fascinating evolutionary implications of a spider that can incapacitate a crystalline warrior with a single bite. Not surprisingly, no hands, appendages, or pseudopods were raised. The medical bay of the Galactic Academy had never seen such a spectacle. A team of the galaxy's finest xenobiologists swarmed around Zix's crystalline form, their movements precise and urgent. The warrior's bioluminescent nodes were now pulsing with the irregular rhythm of a malfunctioning quantum drive. Professor Thorne stood at a central control station, surrounded by floating holographic displays showing Zix's rapidly deteriorating vital signs. Fascinating. The venom isn't just affecting his nervous system. It's creating a cascading resonance in his crystalline matrix. Dr. Varus, are you seeing these energy patterns? A shimmering being of pure energy turned their attention from Zix to the readings. Remarkable, Professor. The toxin has found a way to propagate through his secondary and tertiary neural pathways simultaneously. It's as if it's learning and adapting to his biology in real time. Nova pushed her way through the crowd of medical personnel, her crystalline form vibrating with anger. Professor, you knew this would happen, didn't you? This wasn't just a demonstration. This was a necessary lesson, Thorne finished, his eyes never leaving the medical displays. One that every species in the galaxy needs to learn sooner or later. Earth's biosphere didn't evolve to be convenient or predictable. It evolved to survive. Lumi floated nearby, 
their aurora-like form rippling with concerned colors. But Professor, how could a spider from Earth possibly have venom that affects crystalline life forms? The evolutionary distance alone. That's the beautiful irony, Thorne said, directing a stream of data to the medical team. Earth's venomous creatures didn't evolve to kill aliens. They evolved to survive on a planet where everything was trying to kill them. The complexity of their toxins isn't about targeting specific species. It's about having as many chemical weapons as possible, just in case. A series of urgent beeps drew everyone's attention. Zix's tertiary heart rate was climbing to dangerous levels, and his normally rigid crystalline structure was showing signs of molecular instability. Dr. Varys, Thorne called out, initiate protocol Earth-7. We need to introduce the modified antivenom before his matrix begins to fracture. The energy being pulsed in acknowledgement, directing a series of robotic arms to position themselves around Zix. Each arm carried a different compound, carefully calibrated to counter the spider's devastating venom. You see, class, Thorne continued, seemingly calm despite the crisis unfolding before them. Earth's venoms are particularly dangerous because they don't play by the usual rules of biochemistry. They don't target one specific pathway or system. They're like molecular shotguns, firing thousands of different compounds at once, hoping something hits a vital spot. The antivenom began flowing into Zix's system through specially designed quantum infusers. Gradually, his wild bioluminescent display began to stabilize, the chaotic patterns settling into more regular rhythms. The truly fascinating part, Thorne added, making notes on his data pad, is how this particular spider's venom affects so many different species. We've documented cases across carbon-based, silicon-based, crystalline, and even energy-based life forms. It's as if, by pure chance, this little arachnid evolved the perfect universal solvent for complex nervous systems. Nova's anger had given way to scientific curiosity. But, Professor, surely this means Earth must be the most dangerous death world in charted space? Yes, quite possibly, Thorne smiled. A planet where even the smallest creatures can kill you isn't just dangerous, it's educational. Everything on Earth had to evolve extraordinary defenses or extraordinary weapons, often both. Natural selection at its finest. Zix's primary consciousness began to reassert itself, his voice weak but steady. Professor, I believe I owe you and your Earth Spider an apology. Never in my combat training have I experienced anything like this. Oh, good, you're conscious, Thorn beamed. How would you describe the experience for your fellow students? The warrior was quiet for a moment, his nodes pulsing softly. It was like being unmade, molecule by molecule. All my strength, my crystalline resilience meant nothing. The venom found paths through my structure I didn't even know existed. It was humbling. And that, Thorne declared triumphantly, is precisely the lesson I wanted to teach. The galaxy is full of wonders and terrors, often in the same package. Size doesn't determine deadliness. Evolution doesn't care about our preconceptions. And sometimes the most dangerous thing in the room is the creature you dismissed as harmless. The medical team began final stabilization procedures as Thorne turned to address the whole class. Your assignment for next week is to research and document three examples of seemingly harmless Earth creatures that could theoretically kill your species. And please, do try to pick something other than the funnel web spider. There are so many wonderful options to choose from. As the students filed out of the medical bay, still processing what they'd witnessed, Lumi lingered behind. Professor, one last question. If Earth has creatures this deadly, how did humans survive long enough to reach the stars? Thorne's smile took on a predatory edge. Now that, my curious friend, is a lesson for another day. But here's a hint. We're the most dangerous thing to ever evolve on that death world. Pleasant dreams. A week after the infamous spider incident, the atmosphere in Lecture Hall 7 had changed dramatically. Gone were the dismissive comments about Earth's creatures. Instead, students spoke in hushed tones about their research assignments, each having discovered dozens of seemingly innocuous Earth species that could spell their doom. Zix sat in his usual spot, but his crystalline form held a new rigidity, a physical reminder of his close encounter. 
The emergency medical intervention had prevented any permanent damage, but his pride had undergone a profound transformation. His bioluminescent nodes now pulsed with a more measured, thoughtful rhythm. Professor Thorne surveyed his class, noting how Nova had moved from her back row seat to the front, her seven eyes fixed intently on his desk. Lumi's aurora-like form rippled with anticipation rather than their usual academic detachment. Before we conclude our unit on Earth's biodiversity, Thorne began, pacing before his desk, I want to share something important. The spider incident wasn't just about showing you a dangerous creature. It was about understanding why Earth species are the way they are. He paused, letting his gaze sweep across the diverse array of life forms before him. Consider this. On Earth, even the smallest creatures must be ready for anything. A spider doesn't know if its next encounter will be with an insect, a bird, a mammal, or even a crystalline warrior from across the galaxy. It must be prepared for everything. Lumi's colors shifted thoughtfully. Like the humans themselves, Professor? Exactly, Thorne's face lit up. We humans survived on a world where everything, from the largest predator to the smallest spider, evolved to be lethal. We didn't become the dominant species through strength alone. We learned to respect everything, to study everything, to understand that even the tiniest creature could end us if we grew careless. Zix's nodes pulsed in agreement. No wonder humans make such formidable scientists, Professor. Your entire evolution was a crash course in survival analysis. Thorne nodded, his expression growing serious. But here's the real lesson. Every life form, no matter how small or seemingly insignificant, has value, has purpose, has the potential to surprise you. Earth taught humanity this lesson the hard way, through countless painful encounters with its various residents. Nova raised several appendages. Is that why Earth remains largely quarantined? To protect other species from its ecosystem? Partially, Thorne chuckled, but mostly to protect its ecosystem from the rest of the galaxy. After all, if a tiny spider can take down a Crixian warrior, imagine what Earth's deadlier residents could do to an unprepared alien ecosystem. The class fell silent, contemplating the statement. Finally, Lumi spoke up, their form glowing with new understanding. Professor, one last question. Do you ever miss Earth? Thorne's smile turned enigmatic as he glanced out the window at the alien world beyond. Miss it? My dear student, I carry Earth with me everywhere I go. Its lessons are written in my DNA, in every cautious step I take, in every careful observation I make. Earth taught humanity that survival isn't about being the biggest or strongest. It's about respect, adaptation, and most importantly, never underestimating anything. He turned back to his class, eyes twinkling. Now then, who's ready to learn about the box jellyfish? Not a single student dared to look uninterested.